Today, we are going to talk about one of the most exciting and fascinating areas of research and that is oral traditions. When we talk of oral traditions, we mean legends, myths, ballads, women's songs and these are often seen as stratified pieces of oral narratives. Now you may wonder why is it that you do not see enough of the use of oral traditions within historical writings. Historical writings are broadly determined or rather depend heavily upon gazetteers and other historical records such as epigraphy, numismatics, analysis of architecture depending on the period of history to which it belongs. But we are interested in recovering what is known as oral traditions of people, oral histories. By and large, these are located within ethnographic studies, anthropological, etc. How does oral traditions help in reconstructing women's histories, community histories, and why is it important even for historical reconstruction? To what extent can we go back into the past with these sources and what are the limitations of these sources are also questions which we are going to bring up. By and large, oral traditions are of extreme importance when we are dealing with peasant communities, tribal communities, people who are broadly classified as pre-writing communities. I don't like to use the word literate. I am very deliberately using the uh, word pre-writing, that is those people whose culture and cultural transmissions take place through oral sources. Legends, myths, ballads, women's songs are often seen as stratified pieces which reflect the community norms, value systems, etc. No doubt these sources have tremendous problem. The tremendous problem is we can't fit it into one of the most important aspects of history writing that is putting them within a chronological framework. Let me tell you uh, how is it that it reveals some aspects of the past and why is it difficult to put it in a chronological order. Because oral traditions the words which are transmitted through the mouth, you're not able to fit it in a time frame. They are not transmitted without changes over a period of time. If we were to look into India, we have a very, very vast and rich collection of oral traditions which continued over a period of time until they were much at a much later age committed to texts. Like for instance, you look at our Ramayan, you look at our Mahabharat, the Hitopadesh, the Jataka tales, or even the ballads like the Puada songs which are sung in Maharashtra. All these were a rich source of oral traditions. Even the Vedas were orally transmitted body of knowledge which got written down as uh, in its textual form at a much, much later age. So when we talk of oral traditions, do we say that these songs which are repositories of ancient wisdom carried along unchanging without any change in them? No, it can't be because with each age and each community interprets them in its own way. For instance, all of us are familiar with the story of Shakuntala. Shakuntala is one part of a story which comes up in Ramayan. Now, through the years, the story and the portrayal of Shakuntala has got transformed over a period of time. Shakuntala, which reveals through the works of Romila Tapar that this is a story, an ancient story, which has got rewritten depending on the social context in which the story gets narrated. We just need to read into the Ramayana 
or the Mahabharat to say where the divergence happened, how many subplots occur more importantly in the Mahabharat than in the Ramayan and what kind of social practices existed during those days. Don't you think from some of the stories there were possibilities of polyandry, polygamy and perhaps even a recognition where a woman could actively approach a man for a relationship. Then again we come to other stories. We can go on discussing how these oral traditions are stratified pieces of history. They are not history per se, they are not necessarily in mainstream history recognized as history, but nonetheless they reveal very many important aspects of the past. Subaltern communities are now turning towards these sources to challenge elite power and reclaim the lives of the people. Now this too is a very important point because we need to recognize community traditions are not unilateral. There are many things involved when we talk of oral traditions. They include legends, myths, songs and proverbs. Each one of them have different roles to play in the formation of a group identity. Songs express the feelings of the people immediately. There are ballads which describe the bravery of some kings in the past or maybe some folk hero. Legends and myths may record the migration of people from one area to another. It's very interesting actually because they would probably describe of how seven sisters and seven brothers came in a bird and landed in a particular area. And they may be seen as gods. Coming in a bird would it not very well be just migrating in a boat, in a ship, in some distant past. So proverbs in particular are very important because they are literally the unwritten constitution of a community. It tells people what kind of behavior is acceptable behavior, what kinds of behavior is not acceptable. It helps to socialize younger generation into a certain form of behavior. Before I come to how folk legends and myths are, can be used for empowerment and how these instruments are political, I would like to focus a little bit on proverbs because proverbs like what you would say empty vessels make the most sound. It tells people what kind of behavior is acceptable and usually these proverbs have some kind of an alliterative function. If you speak of it in your own mother tongue, you will recognize there is a beat to the proverb and this is because it can be transmitted from one generation to another. But what also happens in this case is that there is a rule of ethics governing who can quote a proverb and who cannot. Having briefly described the function, I would like to also add much of the folk literature that we do have today, stories of legends, myths, etc. are recorded in 19th century ethnographic records of gazetteers. We owe the British quite a lot and the least of them was that they have documented a lot of Indian community histories, oral traditions, etc. Now these are very important things because in the current generation you will find that there is no community speaks in one voice. There are fissures, there are gaps between community, there are tensions in villages or any as in any part of the world. Now Dalit historians are trying to reclaim these legends and traditions so that they can empower their people and also at that time claim that at one time the Dalits were not a subordinated group but rather were the rulers of this land and were sometimes cheated by the present dominant caste 
and deprived of their rightful inheritance. Stories like Ekalavya and Trishanku, all of us are very familiar with in the Mahabharata. They are used to indicate the historical denial of education to the subaltern communities. So the origin stories are extremely important because it argues that we had political power which we were deprived of by the dominant communities and we need to claim our power. As I said earlier, different genres of oral narratives have different functions. I will speak more about folk songs here because folk songs are also not sung in one voice. There is a male voice, there is a female voice, there is a difference between what men sing and what women sing. When you look and analyze men's songs, it would be discussing things like wars, heroic deeds and some kind of a bravery, glorifying bravery and the achievements of men. But the songs of women sung when they are in the paddy fields or when they are putting their babies to sleep or during the wedding time, they speak about women's experiences of subordination, marginalization and alienation. When we talk of songs, Leela Dubey, a very well-known anthropologist in India, has done a very deep analysis of some of the songs from different parts of India. Some of the songs in West Bengal which have come out indicate the sorrow of a little girl, a new bride, probably a pre-puberty bride uh, in her husband's home. She speaks of how when she went into the kitchen and she got scared of the servant over there, she went into the garden and she was asked to go into the room. So these are really experiences that describe a woman's sorrow. Some songs uh, would perhaps uh, depict uh, the sorrows of a girl. Many of the songs in Gujarat too would be discussing some of the difficulties that a young bride finds in her marital home. Now when we come to poetry and proverbs, proverbs as I told you earlier are the unwritten constitution of an oral community. There are various kinds of proverbs. No one speaks of a proverb as if he has invented a proverb. In the past, this is what our elders said. A senior person can quote a proverb to a younger person, but a younger person will not retaliate with a proverb to the older one. A lot of these proverbs have an element of fun and folk wisdom. All of you, I would suggest, go back into your community, try to collect as many of these proverbs and see what kind of folk, folk wisdom you will get. For instance, in my own language, he is so bad to his family but he goes to Varanasi for a pilgrimage. In other words, it's critical of a man who neglects his family and goes to Varanasi for a pilgrimage. There are many such interesting proverbs we can go on. Similarly, lower castes also have their own set of proverbs which would be critical of the dominant discourse. But it may not always be overt. It takes a great deal of effort to recover these songs and these proverbs and to highlight the kind of social tension and fissures, the opposition to the dominant discourse continues to exist within subaltern groups. Now the importance of these sources is that they express the lived experiences of the people. I told you these sources are also something which are constantly reinvented and re-expressed. Like for instance, it's happening today. A.K. Ramanujan mentions one proverb where the students in a campus in the US say to Xerox is to know. These are short sayings and proverbs which express the experiences of the people. Encoded in the oral narratives are also, as I said earlier, a critique of the dominant order. There is 
an understanding of the critique and it takes our effort to highlight these experiences. Women's folk songs highlight their lived experiences and the kind of difficulties that they experience. Now there is a difference very often between the beat, the rhythmic beat of the songs sung by men and the songs sung by women. There is greater fluidity and space for innovation in the narratives sung by women. The location of the narrator is extremely important. While the songs sung by the marginalized communities contain a critique of the dominant order, songs sung by the dominant group may contain comments that are derogatory to the subaltern groups and to women. And I think these are trends, particularly when it comes to gender relationships, we see these trends carried forward in our Bollywood films, etc. Folk songs, folk traditions are something which are deeply embedded in the consciousness of a particular community and keeps reinforcing and getting expressed in many ways. The number of books which are coming out today in a reinvented form of the ancient stories and myths that we have had in our culture. I have already discussed the power relationships that exist between the narrator and the person who listens in a caste-based society. And a man, although convention demands, a man from the lower caste cannot criticize the man from the upper caste, but definitely they have a decided view on it and a definite take on the relationship between within a caste group. In today's context, Rakshasas, whom we have all read of in our Amar Chitra Kathas and we have heard through the Kathas or whatever, are actually seen as Rakshaks, those who protected the forest wealth, the original inhabitants of this country. So you see how stories can get reinterpreted and reused so that it can actually be a source of empowerment. Some of the important proverbs that we've heard about is idle minds is a devil's workshop. Uh, empty vessels make more sound. There are many such proverbs which we have already discussed in this lecture and I do hope you will make a habit of collecting these proverbs but we must remember it's very difficult to fit these proverbs into a time frame. So you will automatically ask me, how can this matter be used in history? Obviously, it has a place in an ethnographic study or in an anthropological study. But how would you use it in history and why is it important to recover these stories even within the context of history? I'll tell you why. Because very often the written sources that we refer to as historical knowledge or sources of history does not really reflect the diversity of historical experiences across this country. The people who were not at the helm of affairs creating the movers and shakers of history. How do we get their experiences? How does it become a part of this record of history? And that is when we need to look into these proverbs to record them. Prem Chaudhary has done a very important study in Haryana. And in her study, what she pointed out, how the colonial policies, because the colonial law clearly said that we will respect the cultural practices of the natives. That is the Queen Victoria's proclamation. But in effect, they constantly upheld male power and determined the right practice of a community as part of what was seen part of the Victorian culture. Prem Chaudhary through her use of proverbs, folk songs and uh, women's experiences 
narrated in songs, she pointed out how during the 19th century, cultures, indigenous practices got reinterpreted in ways by which it upheld the power of the Jat men against the Jat women. Similarly, there are very, very interesting critical rereadings of texts possible through oral narratives. All of us know of this discussion between uh, the 1857 was it a mutiny or the first war of independence. Now, there are primary written records by men who, that is the British men who participated in the suppressing of the uh, mutiny and they have recorded their stories which reading against the grain can give you an idea of the kind of brutalities that were put against the Indians. But what did it mean to the Indians themselves? There are songs from Bundelkhand which continue to be narrated which still speak of Tantya Top and of course Jansi Ki Rani. I am not talking of uh, Subhadra Kumari Chauhan's uh, poem on um, Jansi Ki Rani which all of us know but rather there are other forms which showed that there was a living struggle for freedom at that particular point of time and it was not something which could be denigrated as a mutiny. Therefore, whom do you want to believe? Was history one or were there many histories? Where does the excitement of recreating history come from? Would it not be from recovery of these sources? So folklorists like the idea of resistance and this is the resistance that I've been talking of. The fissures that exist between communities across the caste group in a particular village community between men and women. Women too have their own way of critiquing the dominant order that is patriarchy which has put women down. Women's voices like Prem Chaudhary's work and some of my own work which also shows that women's stories, women's songs, through the use of these songs, we can overturn the dominant colonial and histories or even the post-colonial domination. Traditional folklorists tended to dismiss women's songs and folklore as powerless and not of great value. But today, Across the world, there is a recognition that these oral traditions and the collect which represent the collective memory of women in that particular community should have value. We can go on to discuss it because in some of the islands in Australia, for instance, women's religious rights which were recovered have also been accepted in the court that there was, that this land had a sacred work. Very briefly, what I have discussed today has covered the broad spectrum of oral traditions, including myths, legends, folk songs, and ballads, and proverbs. What I've emphasized in my uh, conversation today is that these different genres of folk traditions have different function. They have both a performance aspect in it and an oral aspect of it. The meaning is not always in the word. It is in the performance. It is in the projection. And although there are certain unchanging aspects to these, they tend to change over a period of time. And at each retelling, it reflects the politics the, of that particular period. Like some of the traditional stories of Rakshasas, Asuras, and the Devas, we had taken it for granted and we have read of it through our Amachitrakata days. But today from the politics of empowering Palace, these stories become extremely important in overturning the caste hierarchy, in empowering the people with the knowledge of their histories and the past. So in the final context, the question is, what is history? What is a legend 
or what is a myth. These categories of research or data theories can get uh, diluted. <clears throat>